the campus of Volunteer State Community College. This is Inside Politics. Welcome to Inside Politics. I'm Grady Eads. We've spent this fall meeting the candidates for governor of Tennessee in 2010. Today we'll shift gears to international politics. We will be discussing Afghanistan and the surrounding areas and what we can learn from history about future U.S. involvement in that area. My guests today are fellow faculty members here at Volunteer State, Associate Professor of History George Pimentel and Associate Professor of Geography Keith Bell. Thanks for being here today, gentlemen. Thank you. Well, the first thing I'd like to start off with is Afghanistan is often depicted as an uncivilized or ungovernable nation. Some even say using the term nation is inappropriate. Are these accurate assessments? Um, sometimes uh, people need to differentiate between first uh, what is a state, nation state, and a nation. A nation state typically is just a group of people within this political entity. Um, but a nation is this ethnic group of people. Um, and so Afghanistan is very different from some of its neighboring states. If you have seen uh, a map of Central Asia, for instance, there would be Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, uh, Tajikistan. Stan means the land of or the home of. And so you have these ethnic group of people that are the dominant uh, group within those countries. Uh, however, Pakistan nor Afghanistan really fits that. There's no real Afghan people. So there are lots of different nations within this political entity that is Afghanistan. And it's largely dominated by the Pashtun, who's, that's about 38, 40 percent of the people. Tajiks make up another 25 percent. And then you have a whole host of other kinds of ethnic groups here, um, from Hazaras in the center of the country to uh, Nuristanis, and, uh, just a hodgepodge of different individuals, uh, which have different social customs, languages, um, religions even, uh, different kinds of uh, Islam. So uh, there is this political entity that is Afghanistan, but w underneath there's a whole lot of other stuff going on. And so to have a nation state, it would assume then that everybody's going in the same direction, and that's not the case for Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. yeah, early on, too, what we have between Pakistan and, and Afghanistan is a border that was questionable um, after World War II, and there was some debate about whether or not, um, well, some people just did not recognize the, the current border between Pakistan. They essentially gave Pakistan, when they created it, um, part of what has traditionally been Afghan land. And so that plays into the ethnic groups and their decisions. Okay. Well, it sounds like we have some similar problems here in Afghanistan that we have had in Iraq over the last few years, is that Iraq is a nation, but really it's broken up into three groups, the Sunnis, the Shiites, and the Kurds. Um, do those kind of religious differences still come to play in Afghanistan as well? That, that, that would kind of surprise you. We t not knowing much maybe about Islam, I would typically just throw them all in together, but uh, there's a real difference between Shiites and Sunnis. Uh, the Sunnis have their holy cities, uh, the holiest cities in Mecca and Medina, which is in Saudi Arabia, but uh, a large number of the Hazara, for instance, are, are largely Shiite. And in southern Iraq is where you'd find uh, Karbala and Najaf, which are their holiest cities, which uh, the Sunni and the Shia, they can coexist in some cases, but when religious fervor comes into it, as often happens now in Afghanistan with the Taliban having uh, taken control in the mid-1990s, uh, these are heightened sense of uh, competitive nature between two very disparate, though Islamic groups. Um, so uh, th those, are, those are real sticking points for some of the people here. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, how do some of the regional players play in? Of course, uh, Iraq on the other side of Iran, even Iran's being drawn into some of this. I had uh, seen a report uh, just a couple of days ago, of, or excuse me, I saw it a couple of days ago, but it happened about a month ago of mm -hmm. uh, a terrorist attack in, into Iran from uh, violent Sunnis coming across from Pakistan and supported by Pakistan through southern Afghanistan. So a lot of this is all kind of tied in together too. Are there religious differences between Afghanistan and Iran that would lead to attacks inside Iran from Afghanistan? That's what I think that uh, has happened with the support of uh, the Taliban. Taliban means students, uh, Talib, uh, students of Islam. And that they got the Pashtuns are in the southern part of Afghanistan, but stretching a swath across kind of a uh, central part of Pakistan. So they've been working for quite some time together, and these are the doors that are open uh, for movement of heroines, weapons, money, uh, 
bombs, for instance. And so uh, different groups, different allegiances supporting different entities in other places, whether it's Hezbollah or Hamas or whatnot. So it's very intricate. So we could talk all day about it, I'm sure. But um, uh, anyway, that's about it. <laughs> uh, well, how does the geography of the region um, fit into kind of its fracturing? And we, we know, we've, we've heard so much about uh, Tora Bora and the mountains. Mm -hmm. um, is Afghanistan primarily a mountainous region? Are there, are there flats, breakaways, pasture lands? I mean, how do those kinds of things feed into, I guess, the mindset, the culture of how this place holds together? Well, there are different... Um uh, from lowlands to highlands, you get s severe in the southwest, if you can kind of call it that, of the country is uh, severe desert, true, true arid desert. Steppe lands, the farther north and east that you go. Uh, in the interior is the uh, Hindu Kush Mountains, and this is where you'd find a lot of uh, settlement around that mid uh, elevation, not too low, but not too high, and that's where the agricultural regions would be. Um, but the mountain passes are pretty uh, important for this area too, like the Khyber Pass, uh, going from uh, what is you know, toward Islam Islamabad all the way into Kabul, and it's a really tightly controlled choke point there. Um, so that's kind of the trade that goes on, but uh, it ranges from desert to mountain and not a lot in between. <laughs> it's a pretty rugged topography. What do they do in terms of infrastructure? I mean, if... Yeah. Um. You know, military speaking, um, from and what's what's making Afghanistan very interesting from the military standpoint is that the two most difficult f forms of fighting would be when you get into an urban setting and you're fighting house to house and those kinds of things. So you're going to produce a, a lot of casualties. Mm -hmm. um, but the second m most important here is the mountainous ra regions. You just can't get there. There's no magic bomb that you can <laughs> drop on these guys. Um, and, and that's one of the fears, um, that when the American surge happens, if we go out and actively um, look for the Taliban, look for al-Qaeda, um, we're going to be involved in some heavy mountain fighting. And there's going to be a lot of casualties, in, in my opinion, based on what has happened in the past. It happened with the Russians. It, might, mm -hmm. it seems like it might happen with us. And I, it it's becomes a question of whether the American public is going to be uh, ready for a much more significant casualty list mm -hmm. than what we saw when we were in Iraq. Uh, so, some, uh, real quick, some sure. of our technology, I think, is hindered here just because of the very remote nature uh, of this. We've heard about a continuation of the Bush administration policy uh, into uh, the Obama administration of using uh, predator drones, for instance, over in northern Pakistan in the tribal regions, where, of course, is safe haven for a lot of the Taliban and al-Qaeda that's still presumed to be in this area. So you hear of uh, uh, some uh, missile shots out there. But, of course, with any missile shot, you have uh, what is now termed uh, collateral damage. Mm -hmm. You've killed a bunch of innocent people along with the people you wanted to, and that doesn't really help uh, overall win the hearts and minds of these individuals. So uh, stepping up and coming in, you, you asked about infrastructure, coming in and actually bringing change to these people's lives, um, uh, building schools and the uh, Central Asia Institute of uh, Greg Mortensen, I have the book Three Cups mm -hmm. of Tea here, a uh, wonderful book, uh, talks about uh, changing radicalism based on uh, uh, changing the way people have an education. Madrasas uh, are Islamic schools and were uh, supported here um, by uh, sheikhs in the Middle East, uh, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, and they really only educate boys and they only read the Quran. That's not a really well-wounded liberal education at all. Um, but as far as roads, I mean, how difficult is it? They have major roads going through here, but going through the mountains. You're talking about, you know, what is it, detonations and blowing out rock, and that takes a long time to have a, you know, a pass. Uh, going through there, but I have seen uh, over the um, la some statistics about f female mortality rates in, in childbirth, for instance, uh, second highest in the world uh, that the that the mother would be dying giving birth. Well, she's giving it at, at home. She's not in any hospital or a clinic. Maybe there's a midwife present, uh, and still second worst in the world. And they've improved over the last 20 years by so dropping that mortality rate by six percent. So it tells you they still have a very long way to go. High population growth rate, but uh, mortality rates that are just phenomenal. 